Now listen, if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did the boat sink? No, we haven't resurrected Kent Hovind for another coveted golden crocodile. I just want you to watch carefully as he leads his audience through a fairly simple piece of mathematical logic. And we're going to compare it with his son's preaching of exactly the same story. Hey, if we were to go scuba diving and we found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I ask you the simple question, hey, when did that boat sink? And you say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Look at the dates on the coins. See, if there's a coin in there from 1750, you ought to be able to figure out the boat sank after 1750. How many can figure this out with no help? Well, sure, that would be easy for a third grader, right? But notice how Hovind only asks the audience if they were able to figure this out after he's already given them the answer. We're going to find out why in a segment called I Should Have Listened to My Daddy. Watch how young Eric Hovind preaches exactly the same thing, but with one crucial difference. He didn't learn this lesson from his daddy. No matter how easy it is, you never, ever ask a room full of creationists a question that requires the mathematical skills of a third grader. If you find a coin in there from, let's see here, 1750, then you know the boat sank when? Before 1750 or after 1750? Before. Told you. After 1750. No, not before 1750 because... We've got a coin in there from 1750. Now believe me, Eric, in the next 20 seconds, this creationist audience isn't going to get any smarter. So please, don't ask them anything else. So then I find one in there that is from, ooh, 1859. Don't do it. Now we've even limited even farther. Hey, when we're trying to figure out when that boat sank, do I look for the oldest coin or the youngest coin? The youngest coin. All right, we'll get it figured out here. No, they won't. Remember, these are people who wonder why there are still monkeys if we all descended from monkeys. Your audience doesn't want to have to figure these things out. All they want you to do is give them a piece of information and they'll be happy to believe it. Like this. You don't go poking around in the box and find the oldest coin. You find the youngest coin. And that becomes what is called the limiting factor. The boat could not be older than that. The point about this limiting factor is that Hovin Sr. wants to apply it to the age of the Earth. And Hovin Jr. wants to copy whatever Hovin Sr. did. And so we come to the limiting factor that is the distance of the Moon. The Moon is going around the Earth. How many knew that already? The moon goes around the earth. I, I don't okay. know. The moon goes around the earth. That's good, Eric. How many of you guys knew that already? You guys had that figured out? Okay, the moon goes around the earth. Yep. By the way, does anybody know its official name? It's called the moon, Eric. That's way too hard. Cut to daddy. Did you know, as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting farther away. We're slowly losing the moon. The moon is getting farther and farther away from the Earth. Good. Now give it some drama. Guys, we're losing the moon! Not that much. The moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. So that means that it used to be closer. Because you go backwards in time, let's see, if the moon is here and it's getting farther away, that means that it used to be... Uh, I don't know. ...closer to the Earth. Good job. I think they might just have grasped that. Well, now I've got some sad news to relate, Eric. While your daddy was great at reaching down to the scientific level of his audience, he wasn't very, how can I put this, enlightened when it came to basic science himself. He gained the title Doctor through this doctoral dissertation submitted to this, uh, university. To put it delicately, he was great at quoting the Bible, but he sucked at physics. And that's what's got you landed with a Golden Crocodile nomination. So that brings us to the next segment called I Shouldn't Have Listened to My Daddy. And if you run all the math on this, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the Earth. You go back about 1.3 billion years, now you've got a serious problem because the moon is skimming the surface of the Earth. See, the thing is this. Obviously, the moon couldn't have been skimming the surface of the Earth 1.3 billion years ago, 
that's impossible. So something must be wrong with your daddy's calculation, and it's quite easy to figure out what it is. His calculation was based on the assumption that the moon has always been receding at the same rate, 3.8 centimetres a year. But of course it hasn't. We know this through a simple principle of physics that Hovind Sr. comes very close to understanding. Because the moon causes the tides. Now what's the consequence of the moon's gravitation causing tides? Well, I'm going to exaggerate it in this diagram so you can see what's happening. The moon's gravitational attraction causes a bulge of ocean water in the part of the Earth closest to it. Because the Earth spins faster than the moon orbits, this bulge pulls a little ahead of the moon and it reciprocates the gravitational tug by tugging at the moon itself, as if there was an invisible rope between them. So the moon is dragging on the Earth's spin, slowing it down a fraction of a millisecond every year, and the bulge is pulling on the moon, giving it more energy. Through the conservation of angular momentum, the momentum lost by the Earth must be gained by the moon. As it gains energy, the moon moves to a higher orbit. That's why it's receding. So to assume that the moon has always been receding at the same rate, you have to assume that the tidal configuration we have today has always been the same. And of course it hasn't. The drag exerted by the tides depends on the configuration and depth of the oceans. For most of the Earth's history, the oceans were much more extensive. And of course we have continental drift, which encourages the formation of supercontinents and super-oceans. Fortunately, we don't need to guess what effect this has on recession rates. We can work it out, because we know where the moon was in the past. How do we know? Uh, I don't know. Because some coastal and estuarine sediments in the past, just like today, were laid down with the rhythm of the tides. So we can see how many tides there were in a year. And from coral growth and other seasonal indicators, geologists can work out how many days there were in a year, and therefore how fast the Earth was spinning. And since the period of the Moon's orbit is directly linked to its orbital radius, then we can work out the distance of the Moon from the Earth at various times. And that tells us how much the Moon receded in the intervals between those times. This paper by Williams takes us back nearly two and a half billion years, and during most of the Proterozoic, 2,450 to 620 million years ago, it turns out the Moon was receding at about 1.24 centimetres a year and around 2.17 centimetres a year since then. In other words, much less than it is today. So Hovind's vision of the Moon skimming the surface of the Earth 1.2 or 1.3 billion years ago only works if the recession has been constant, which it hasn't. When we look at the geological evidence, it turns out that 2.5 billion years ago the Moon was only about 10% closer to the Earth than it is today. That's hardly skimming the surface. The varying recession of the Moon was known as far back as 1990, but Hovind Sr. didn't bother to check all this because he's simply regurgitating the musings of other creationists who preceded him. And young Eric didn't question it because, well, he just listens to Daddy. <laughs>